Is that a man brought into the arena at the moment of death, like a dying gladiator, to delight the public with his convulsions? With his convulsions? Or is it one risen from the dead, a vampire with a violin, who, if not the blood out of our hearts, at any rate sucks the gold out of our pockets? The gold out of our pockets? Wildest reports of his appearance exceeded when beholding him. So thin he seemed tall, so dark his haggard features left him ageless. Fleshless body, mere bones, everything sacrificed for his long hands and talon-like fingers. Talon-like fingers. Without his music, his is the soundless body of a cricket or cicada, dead with no shrill or vibrant tones. Dead with no shrill or vibrant tones. His clothes, black, bone-shaped trousers of one who slept in them while ill or too drugged to bother or who had passed the night gambling with curious partners against sinister adversaries. A man called Levy made tours of English music halls with makeup to look like Paganini. A man called Levy made tours of English music halls with makeup to look like Paganini. A good violinist and extraordinary copy of Paganini. Other people later copied this man, announcing themselves years later as the second Paganini. The second Paganini. Paganini hit Vienna as a sensation. Good billiard stroke was called coup a la Paganini. Paganini hit Vienna as a sensation. Busts in butter and crystallized sugar, portraits on snuff boxes, cigar boxes, canes, and gloves. Portraits on snuff boxes, cigar boxes, canes, and gloves. Paganini was an inveterate gambler, forced to pawn his violin to pay his debts, and nearly ruined himself with Casino Paganini, a gambling hell in Paris for which he was refused a license. He never practiced. He never practiced. George Harris of Hanover, a young son of a rabbi, spent an entire year touring with Paganini as his private secretary in order to write an account of him, and during that whole period never saw him open his violin case once. Never saw him open his violin case once. In 1836, passion for gambling returned, and he left Parma for Paris, where the casino Paganini had been opened at his instigation and with his financial support. Involved in endless litigations, lost large sums of money, and further damaged his health. Described at this time as hardly able to move, bent nearly double like a half-opened penknife, and evidently in great pain, and evidently in great pain, had to be carried upstairs, even to first floor. Had to be carried upstairs, even to first floor. Before his death, Paganini acquired yet another illness, the loss of his voice. Desperately, he grasped for help. For help. He would whisper to the ear of his son, who, accustomed to the sounds, would speak out for him. He would whisper to the ear of his son, who, accustomed to the sounds, would speak out for him. I have loved atrocious women in another part of the city. I have loved atrocious women in the other part of the city. Women who are so beautiful, they frighten me. Women who are so beautiful, they frighten me. I have seen a man with no head with wings on his back, carrying his rotting lungs in his arm. I have seen a man without no head, with wings on his back. He was carrying his lungs. I have seen a man dressed as a clown, with tiny fetuses dripping from his beard. I have seen a clown with tiny fetuses dripping from his beard. I have seen a white dog chewing on the moon. On the moon. On the moon. I have seen a house in the middle of the ocean. I have seen a house in the middle of the whole ocean. With tiny octopus inside who tap with their beak on the windows. With tiny octopus who tap their beaks on the window. I have seen a light come down from the sky and point directly to my stomach. I have seen a light from the sky and point directly to my stomach. I think of myself very much as an organization man. I think of myself very much as an organization man. 
It's all outside me. It's all outside me. If you know what I mean. If you know what I mean, she said. I think there are either five kinds of character. I think there are either five kinds of character. Or seven kinds of character. Or seven kinds of character. One might be called the organization man. One might be called the organization man. Another might be called the interpreter. Another might be called the interpreter. Another might be called the helpful woman. Another might be called the helpful woman. Another might be called the woman of the different voice. Another might be called the woman of the different voice. Or different way of speaking. Or different way of speaking. And so on, she said. Each of these characters has its equivalent, I suppose. Each of these characters has its equivalent, I suppose. In the world of unrehearsed knowledge. In the world of unrehearsed knowledge. question of whether we mold our characters. To satisfy that requirement. To satisfy that requirement. Is a question. I couldn't possibly answer here. I couldn't possibly answer here. It could be answered. It could be answered. I could answer it. But not here. But not here, she said. It's enough to point out the importance of those equivalences. It's enough to point out the importance of those equivalences. Assuming that the fact has crossed every person's mind. Assuming that the fact has crossed every person's mind. If only as an answer to why movies. If only as an answer to why movies.
trying to remind us that this movie No less than any other. Depends on the vision of the archetype. Depends on the vision of archetype. For its believability. For its believability. We are not interested in skin as such. We are not interested in skin as such. Or hair as such. Or hair as such. Or bone structures as such. Or bone structures as such. We are not interested in those lessons. We are not interested in those lessons. We can hardly bring ourselves. We can hardly bring ourselves to look into the mirror in the morning. To look into the mirror in the morning. It is a truth. It is a truth. That to reconstruct our image. That to reconstruct our image. Of ourselves. Of ourselves. Individually. Individually. Each day. Each day. To return from dreams. To return from dreams. Is difficult. So, so, it is not an interest in skin and hair and bone structure. It is not an interest in skin and hair and bone structure. That brings us to this movie. That brings us to this movie, she said. Already at the time of opening concerts in Paris, ailing in health, suffering from ravages of disease which killed him. Tubercular affection of the larynx, noticeable in his voice and sparseness of diet, soup or chamomile tea. Taciturn, spoke no more than necessary. On concert tours would hardly eat at all. No longer practiced, but would lie out for hours on a sofa on the day of a concert with a mandolin beside him. Thank you. 
As one of the enigmatic geniuses of our time, of our time, I recognize one. I recognize one who speaks with the tongue of angels. Who speaks with the tongue of angels, taking advantage, taking advantage of this unbelievable opportunity taking advantage of this unbelievable opportunity i throw myself on your moment of glory i throw myself on this moment of glory on this moment of glory not with intent of distraction not with intent of distraction but with an inner desire but with an inner desire to further illuminate to further illuminate the glory of this moment the glory of this moment though money may be the devil's lucre though money may be the devil's lucre it is also the food to sustain the angels it is also food to sustain the angels. Knowing that this money is a commission. Knowing that this money is a commission. Through which my genius will be further enhanced. So that my genius will be further enhanced. I wish the stipend would send you Hector. I wish this stipend would send you Hector. Would send you Hector. To boundless flight. To boundless flight. So the union of the opposites. So that the union of the opposites. Of thunder and lightning. Of thunder and lightning. Can be accomplished forever and evermore. So that can be accomplished forever and evermore. To be accomplished. Can be accomplished. Can be accomplished forever and evermore. The friendship of Berlioz was his rare intellectual adventure. Berlioz had composed his symphony Herald in Italy for Paganini, but the latter refused it when he discovered too many rests in the solo viola part. Later, after hearing both Herald and the fantastic symphonies, Paganini suddenly became ecstatic about Berlioz's work and surprised him by a gift of 20,000 francs. This was an extraordinary event in artist-to-artist -artist relationships in general and some were firmly convinced that the commission did not come from Paganini, but from someone hiding behind this publicity stunt. Paganini approached Berlioz after the concert, knelt on the platform to kiss the hand of Berlioz, 
Paganini's son, his beloved and illegitimate son, Achillino, then a child of ten, had to stand on a chair and put his ear to Paganini's lips in order to interpret his father's inaudible words, and how he presented Berlioz, nearly destitute as usual, with a draft for 20,000 francs as a commission for a piece of music. The real truth about the above incident, the donor of the money was not Paganini, but Armand Bertin, the rich proprietor of the Journal des Debats. Berlioz was on the staff of that paper. Bertin had a great opinion of his talents and was looking for an opportunity to help him. He thought that a gift of money would be more acceptable to Berlioz if it took the form of a presentation from some other celebrated musician. He therefore persuaded Paganini to act as donor. brings us to this movie, a commission from Fandango Spagnolo. Look at that, Sheila. How nice. In the earthly copies of Justice and Temperance and the other ideas which are precious to souls. There is no light, but only a few approaching the images through the dark wing organs of stones behold in them the nature of that which they imitate, unquote. I don't understand that. In the earthly copies of justice and temperance and the other ideas, which are precious to souls. There is no light, but only a few approaching the images through the darkling organs of sense, beholding them the nature of that which they imitate. Unquote. I don't understand that. In the earthly copies of justice and temperance and the other ideas which are precious to souls, there is no light, but only a few approaching the images to the dark my organs of sense, behold in them the nature of that which they, they imitate. I don't understand that. Anyway, later. From Skepsis, says Strabo, came Metrodorus, or Metrodorus, a man who changed from his pursuit of philosophy to political life, and taught rhetoric, for the most part, in his written works. And he used a brand new style and dazzled many. He seems to have played a considerable political as well as cultural role at the court where he was for a time in high favor. The Plutarch hints that he was eventually put out of the way by his brilliant but cruel master. I think I understand that. Lived in Paris for the next two years. Sir Charles Halle, a young student, provides the best description of Paganini in those years. The striking, awe-inspiring, ghost-like figure of Paganini was to be seen nearly every afternoon in the music shop of Bernard Latte, Passage du Opéra, where he sat for an hour, enveloped in a long cloak, taking notice of nobody, and hardly ever raising his piercing black eyes. 
He was one of the sights of Paris, and I had often gone to stare at him with wonder until a friend introduced me to him, and he invited me to visit him, an invitation I most eagerly accepted. I went often, but it would be difficult to relate a single conversation we had together. He sat there, taciturn, rigid, hardly ever moving a muscle of his face, and I sat spellbound, a shudder running through me whenever his uncanny eyes fell upon me. He made me play to him often, mostly by pointing with his bony hand to the piano without speaking, and I could only guess from his repeating the ceremony that he did not dislike it, for never a word of encouragement fell from his lips. How I long to hear him play, it is impossible to describe, perhaps even to imagine. From my earliest childhood, I had heard of Paganini and his art as something supernatural, and there I actually sat opposite to the man himself, but only looking at the hands that had created such wonders. On one never-to-be-forgotten occasion, after I had played and we had enjoyed a long silence, Paganini rose and approached his violin case. There passed in me what can hardly be imagined. I was all in a tremble, and my heart thumped as if it would burst my chest. In fact, no young swain going to the first rendezvous with his beloved could possibly feel more violent emotions. Paganini opened the case, took the violin out, and began to tune it carefully with his fingers without using the bow. My agitation became more intolerable. When he was satisfied and I said to myself, now, now he'll take the bow, he carefully put the violin back and shut the case. And that is how I heard Paganini. On the morning of Paganini's death, the Bishop of Nice gave instructions prohibiting the tolling of the passing bells. A few days later, when it had been embalmed, his body, dressed in the black coat and trousers in which he appeared on the concert platform, was put in a coffin with a glass pane above his face. A dealer in second-hand objects offered the Comte de Cressol, who had been appointed trustee for Aquilino, the sum of 30,000 francs in order to exhibit the corpse in England. The body, shabbily embalmed, was left on his deathbed for the two following months, then removed down to the cellar for a year, 
and eventually, on the order of the health authorities, expelled from the city, ending in a cell of an abandoned leper house on the rocky coast. Soon stories began to circulate, the wails of a violin, other terrifying noises. The body was moved again, first to a cement vat of an olive oil factory, then into the garden of a private house. Four years after that, the body was encased into three coffins. Taking no chances, friends transported the body by ship to Genoa. There had been a cholera epidemic on the French Riviera then by wagon to his family house, where as a boy he helped to plant the vegetables. Still, the church refused to receive him. Thirty years later, the body was finally transferred from the private garden to the cemetery in Parma. Ma che noia. Il cervello. Misuriamo il cervello. Tre. Tre. Povero cervello che... Che bellino, la puccuccia, pure lui, facciamo un piccolo duetto, ma che noia, affanculo. Sto povero credino morto, misuriamo sto petto. La coscia così lunga, figlio mio, la coscia che non te serve, mettiamo un quindici. Eppure l'altra coscia può essere differente, chi lo sa, chi lo sa. Eh sì, la coscia destra che lo ha lavato è molto più lunga, quindici e mezzo. Le povere ginocchia, oh ginocchia, sono due. C'è un altro due, due, due. Misuriamo l'uomo. Ah, sto povero uomo che è crepato. Facciamo un tre cerebrum, unum, duum, treum. Eh. Nasum, quantum, dum. También. Os. Pectum, 
Thinking about life in all its forms. It's one of those days so far where nothing fits. It's one of those days so far where nothing fits. Breakfast at the Holiday Inn Hotel. Where I live. Where I live. Especially where I live in other places. I look forward to breakfast. I look forward to breakfast. I eat six cups of tea plain. I eat six cups of tea plain. pieces of toasted bread. Margarine and honey. Margarine and honey. And time to think about myself. Coordination of body and mind. Coordination of body and mind.
can do in a single form. That I can do in a single form. I don't take the tea to my table. I don't take the tea to my table. I pour myself a cup of tea in one place. I pour myself a cup of tea in one place. And carry my tea to my table. Where I sit to drink it. Where I sit to drink it. Then I go back to the place for another cup. Then I go back to the place for another cup. And so forth. Six trips, more or less. Six trips, more or less. Six cups of tea. Six cups of tea. Same for the three pieces of toast. Same for the three pieces of toast. Same for the three pieces of toast. Same for the three pieces of toast.